Good evening. Welcome to our April 19th, 2022 City Council meeting. It is 7.05 p.m. Meeting is now in session. Tonight's invocation will be led by Chaplain Kelly Dupay from Faith Community Church and Council Member Tabatabai will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege of working and living in the great city of West Covina. And God, tonight, we ask your presence to come and be here with the council as they deliberate, as they plan, as they discuss, as they decide. So, Father, give them wisdom, guide them by your Holy Spirit, and bless our city. Bless our firefighters, bless our police officers, those uh, uh, in the community that are struggling right now. God, we pray your blessing upon uh, our city and upon our nation and And uh, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do. Bless this meeting tonight, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We could all face the flag, right hand over your heart, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Assistant City Clerk, roll call, please. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening. Council Member Tabatabai. Present. Councilman Wu. Here. Councilwoman Lopez Viado. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Diaz. Here. Mayor Castellanos. Here. Thank you. Uh, City Attorney, is there anything to be reported out of closed session? Nothing to report out, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. That takes us to the presentation section of our agenda. We've got a Proclamation for Donate Life Month. Um, could we have Miss Nancy Jolly to the front, please? Since 2005, One Legacy has requested the support of Southern California civic leaders and municipalities to celebrate and encourage the gift of life. Donate Life California saves lives by creating opportunities for all Californians to sign up on the official state organ, eye, and tissue donor registry. In recognition of National Donate Life Month, the month of April 2022 is hereby proclaimed DMV Donate Life Month in the city of West Covina. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I want to share just some statistics before I share my story, and I will be as brief as possible, I promise. 17 people die every day while they're waiting for an organ eye or an organ donation. That's a lot. This last year, even in the pandemic, 2021, 40,000 life-saving transplants happened, which I think is pretty miraculous. 85,600 cornea transplants helped to restore sight. That's a lot. 58,000 tissue donors were healed and their life was enhanced. Organ, eye, and tissue day donation is so important to me, and I want to tell you why. I am always here for information. I'm not here to change anyone's mind. I hope that if you have a fair in your city or you have concerts in the park, that you would contact me. I would love to have a tabling. We do not accept donations. That's not what it's for. We are there to just give out information. You have my contact information. Just let me know, and I will make it happen. 21 years ago, my nephew Lloyd became an organ donor for our family. My oldest nephew saved the lives of four people through organ donation. He received a head injury that he could not recover from, and he is definitely my hero. The heart recipient sent the most beautiful letter to my sister stating, I want to thank you from the bottom of your son's heart for saving my life. We recently found out that the kidney recipient just passed away. So this man who was in his 40s had 21 more years of life due to that donation. Pretty remarkable for a man who wasn't going to live. This is my granddaughter, Caitlin. Twelve 
12 years ago, she was thrown to the floor by her sitter who was angry at her husband. And instead of walking away, took it out on a crying 18-month-old. My angel hero saved the lives of three people through organ donation. Caitlin is my big hero. She may have only been 18 months old, but she has given life to three people. One of her kidneys went to a nine-month-old girl that was given only a few days to live, and she's still doing well 12 years later. Caitlin's liver went to a 44-year-old man who could not rise off his bed to play with his children. And he, too, sent the most beautiful letter to my son, stating, Because of your gift, I can now play outside with my children again. There was not a recipient found in the state of California for Caitlin's heart, and it was flown to the state of Washington, where there was a little girl, eight months old, only had two to three days to live. And this beautiful girl, Sophia, just turned 12. I want to show you this side. Sophia loves dogs. We have had contact with Sophia and her family, which has been a true blessing to our family. Less than 1% have the chance to have donor recipient meet. And we feel very blessed and lucky that that has happened in our lives. On more than one occasion, we have been together, and we just feel like we're family. Two and a half years ago, my great niece Victory was born. Very appropriate name for her. It was just a few months they found out that Victory was in need of a heart transplant. That was before she was three months old. Victory was put on the transplant list, and we don't feel coincidence. We feel miracle. Victory received that heart. She is two and a half years old. And on this side, Victory is eating her cake. Victory gets in trouble, which we love. She is an absolute terrible two, which we love. And there again, we don't believe in coincidence as a family. My nephew Lloyd, Victory is his granddaughter, donor, recipient. Our family also advocates for timeout, an adult timeout. If you become angry, please walk away. If you're around someone who is angry, please invite them to walk away. If an adult had walked away, my beautiful Caitlin would still be alive today. We have a family festival coming up. I would like to leave this. I don't know who to leave it with. And it is a run walk for One Legacy. Come and join Team Caitlin. Um, I've just had knee replacement two months ago, but I'm going to walk. It's in June, so I'm going to walk. And I apologize for standing, having a little bit of a back issue, so I apologize. I have to stand up there. But please contact me if you have any questions. Anyone in the community for questions, please contact me. You could be someone's hero someday. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate it. City of West Covina to you. Thank you for sharing and presenting. And it will go to the West Covina DMV. Since it is DMV. Perfect. Would you like to say anything else? Nope, that's okay. it. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I've said enough. <laughs>
two, three. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to invite former Mayor Lloyd Johnson to the front to present to us about the mosquito uh, issues. Mosquitoes considered the world's deadliest creature, infecting and killing more than one million people each year by spreading pathogens to people when they bite. And LA County Department of Public Health concluded San Gabriel Valley communities accounted for 41% of LA County's West Nile virus virus human cases in 2021. The city of West Covina does proclaim the week of April 17th through 23rd as California Mosquito Awareness Week. Former Mayor Johnson, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's good to see you, Mayor Castellanos, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Diaz, Councilwoman Lopez Viado. Finally got it right after all these years. Mayor Tony, Mayor Bryant, about you. First of all, I'd like to say it's good to see everybody without your bulletproof of <laughs> windows in front of you. <laughs> you know, before I talk about that, I want to remind everybody what Nancy Jacob was saying about One Legacy. You know, every one of you are parents, so we all understand what it's about. When I was on this council, I was involved for five years in a row, or four years, I get back. They put out a wonderful vote, of a float. They do it right there in the city of Arendelle. I would hope that each of you would take the time when they have it there to go visit them. You'll see that. And then they have a breakfast there. Well, all the parents that, or those who donated an organ, all the recipients, they're there. They're there to talk about the stories. I think we get to know them a little bit better. So I, was, I did that for four years in a row, so that's why it touches my heart. So I would hope that you would all just take a chance and take time to go visit them. Now I'm here to talk about the San Gabriel Valley vector mosquito. You know what? I want to thank you for this honor tonight. But mosquitoes, like the mayor said, is one of the biggest killers we have. They're not predators. They don't care who you are, how old you are, or, you know, your race. It doesn't matter. And now with the new one that we have, they don't only bite you one time. They said they'll bite you a dozen different times. It's just the way they are. So there's a lot of things that we can do as residents. Remember, a little teaspoon of water can lay up to thousands of eggs from a mosquito. And every one of them hatch. They usually they won't hatch in running water. If you, have, if you water your yards, you have automatic sprinklers. When they're off in the sunny, you should go around your yards and make sure there's no standing water because this will not only help you, it'll help your neighbors. There's a lot that you can do. You can say, what can I do for myself? It's not only yourself, it's your neighbors. Because we all see, I do that. I walk in the back of my garage after a rain. And if there's any water that runs up, I make sure I dump it out. We all need to do that. It's to help us. But I want everybody to remember one thing. I am your representative. If you can't get anything settled... You're more than welcome to have my cell number. I put it out there. I carried it on my business cards the whole time. 626-665-4769. You can call me, and I will make sure. I've done it with the, the mayor a few times. He's had uh, folks that he's known that had problems. He's called me. I call our director. They took care of it. They went out the next day. They've taken care of it. That's what it's about. It's, it's a city and the San Gabriel Valley Vector working together. We can't do it alone. Because we're not all over the cities. We have a lot of, I think we have like 35 different cities in our district that we have to take care of. But we can't do it by ourselves. We need the help. We need your help. Every one of your help. Like I say, if you have someone in the world saying, hey, I'm getting bit of my mosquitoes, they can either call our office there in West Covina or they can call me. I mean, I will come out, I will take a look at what the problem is, and I will report it, and we will take care of it. So I, I think when we had our director of communications here, a couple of weeks ago, whatever it was, a few weeks ago, he gave a good thing about what goes on. So it's up to each and every one of us. We can't do it by ourselves. You can't do it. It's impossible for this city council to handle the vector mosquitoes. It's up to the residents to take care of their own yard, help their neighbors take care of their yards if they see anything, and report it to us and let us know what's going on. We're not there to judge, you know, with a uh, lot of uh, pools that turn green. We want to know about them. We know what I'm going to do it because those are your biggest mosquito breeders that we ever. We want to know. We don't go there. We just go there and inform them 
what they need to do. We're not there to give tickets. We're not there to give citations or anything else. We're just there to help, and that's exactly what we do. And I want to thank the mayor for reappointing me for another four years to it. I love what I'm doing. My wife loves what I'm doing. She loves that I'm not, she loves that I'm not setting up the mind that dies anymore. And, uh, and, uh, a happy wife makes a happy life. And I have a wonderful life now, and I appreciate, I appreciate the city letting me do what I, I love doing now. And I'm here to always keep you guys there. So if you guys ever have any questions, you all have my phone number. You can call me, and we can sit down and talk. And if there's anything that you need to know, just let me know. Thank you, man. So California mosquito awareness week that we've got out there. Memorialize our picture. Thank you, Roxanne. From the city of West Covina, the proclamation of California Mosquito Awareness Week. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, sir. We'll now move to oral communications. If anyone would like to address the council, please fill out a yellow speaker card and submit it to the assistant city clerk. Assistant city clerk, how many speakers do we have tonight? We have three speaker cards, Mayor. Our first speaker is Albert Ochoa, followed by George Ogden, followed by R. Robinson. Hello, city council. City Mayor, City Staff, City Manager, I'm here to submit a petition that I started with our residential uh, street. It still continues. I gave everybody uh, some documentation so you guys can uh, follow what I'm going to go through right now. I'm not sure how much information um, I shared with Traffic Committee. I'm not sure if you guys saw where we're actually having the accidents. I, I marked the uh, X on all the areas that we're marking. Uh, all the accidents are actually happening. Um, just by doing the, the petition in the, in the neighborhood, a lot of the residents raised their safety concern that it still continues. So it's still an issue ongoing that we need to resolve. Um, I have some um, ideas, just want to submit. Uh, just on the south corner, they have a, what, it's a center medium for those that know that area. There's a picture of a center medium. That's an idea just to help a barrier so they stop crashing into our residents. Um, there's also a speed hump that I attach and put in your uh, folder. Um, and I'll just read a uh, paragraph or so on it. Safety speed management countermeasurements. Um, set, uh, setting speed limits that are safe, consistent, reasonable is the first step in speeding management. And it's important in order to protect all road users, transportation, partitioners employ a variety of strategies to manage speeds on roadways. And speed limits are an integral part of, the, of this. However, simply lowering the speed limit on a particular stretch of road does not always lower the actual speed at which most people drive on the roadway. Therefore, transportation agencies often install speed management countermeasurements in order to get drivers to slow down. What do speed management countermeasurements look like? Speed management countermeasurements are familiar to drivers that have been used for many years. Others are relatively new. All over, all provide great safety and speed management benefits and may offer operations um, cost savings benefit as well. Some examples is uh, speed humps. Uh, a lot of the residents uh, brought that up when I did the petition. Uh, they asked for speed humps. Speed humps generally locate on residential streets or other low uh, speed roads. Uh, these race pavement structures force motors to slow down to a safe speed. Studies show speed humps can be effective at reducing speeds by nearly 10 miles per hour. So we need anything and everything that we can to stop what's been going on for years after years. Uh, I put dates next to those pictures that I put on those uh, document folders to show you all the actions we've been having. And um, 
I know the city came back. They want to help us and add more signage, and we appreciate everything that they're doing. But I don't think the signage, after talking to the residents, the signage is not going to do it itself. I uh, want to thank uh, Rosario. Uh, she responded back to me after that accident, and uh, she was not even in town. And I appreciate the, the help and quick uh, response that she came out. Uh, she actually met with us at our residential, uh, with our residents, and we brought up our safety concerns. So I'm here just to present back again. Uh, speed signs ain't going to do it alone. Traffic enforcement ain't going to do it alone. Uh, I want to thank the West Covina Police Department for helping out uh, doing traffic enforcement, but we can't have them there all the time. They have high crime areas that they need to take care of, so we need another uh, countermeasurement to stop this. On the south corner from where we live at, again, they had the center medium, and it works great. It slows down the traffic. Uh, it does it by itself. You don't need to have police enforcement right there. That would be uh, a permanent solution if we can have that on the north corner. But again, um, I'm here to present it, uh, represent the, uh, the residents that signed the petition, that we do need to slow down traffic uh, to bring back safety back. So... Um, Basically, that's, that's, that's what it is. My petition is 2022, restore safe driving onto our residential streets in West Covina, California. And I got quite a few residents that uh, are behind. They're all saying the same. Some of them were able to make it a day. My, my neighbor, uh, Ben Francesca, uh, raise your hand, please. He's, he's the first one that lives on Garvey uh, coming in, the first residential home. And it starts right there. When I talked to him... He explained to me the same safety concerns. He can't even pull out of his driveway because they're picking up speed. So, you know, that, that's, that, that's where it starts off. we got to slow them down from coming from there before they do the corner turn. Once they're coming too fast over the corner turn, it's too late. They, they lose control, and this is what those pictures that I'm showing you, they, they, it's too late. Um, trying to avoid a serious accident, injury, or fatality. Uh, it, it just brings me chills just to look at the picture of the last accident we had uh, by my residents, knowing that my grandkids, we take care of them and the family comes over. We didn't have Easter this year. We used to have it every year. We just we couldn't do it because. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ochoa. Thank you, sir. No Appreciate it. Mayor, just as an FYI, Mr. Victor um, Tovar is here in support also and wanted that on the official record. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Georgia Ogden, followed by R. Robinson, followed by Bill Elliott. Good evening, the member of the council and staff. Uh, I'm going to start off real quick. Uh, I'm actually here to support number four, but I wanted to say a special thanks to the fire department that we have here in the city and also with our city manager who got it started for us. We had an issue out with the flagpole for the VFW, and there's certainly not too many people that can climb that thing to put a new rope up there. Uh, they brought out the quaint unit and went ahead and restored that for us. It took them a couple of hours to do it. We really agree, appreciate their help. The only problem was they haven't delivered the flags yet, <laughs> so I've got new flags coming in. Anyway, in regards to uh, uh, number four, I'm totally supportive of that. However, I'm going to, it says consideration of an ordinance adopting. I'm going to change that to considering of adopting an ordinance for taking the vehicles. Because if you're going to adopt a vehicle, it's not going to cost us anything. It kind of scares me. You might adopt some of my cars. Quiet over there. You know what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, we have seen a lot going on over the past years. And to be able to protect our citizens has become very difficult for our law enforcement officers. This isn't combat equipment that we're going to be bringing in to go after our citizens. It's to protect the citizens and also to protect our law enforcement officers. How many times can you folks could probably raise your hand that we have sent our equipment out to other cities to help secure a situation and to neutralize it? And it's, this type of equipment is important, I think, for especially for the price tag that's going to be put on it, which is going to be next to nothing. This would uh, save our city money. This would also protect our citizens and protect our police officers, which is, I think is very important. The Just taking a look at that, if you're in a home and you're not having a good time and you're up to no good and you look out the window and you see something out there that's not going to be very favorable to you, you're going to neutralize this situation in a very peaceful manner, 90% of the time. 
That other 10 percent, it's going to happen anyway. We've seen things happening that have been takeover robberies. There's been issues at uh, various different malls. We need the help, and we need the tools to do it. So I would hope that the city council would highly consider this. I'm not talking about bringing in gunships and stuff like this. We need stuff to help to protect our citizens and our police officers. So I want to thank you for allowing me the time to speak on this. And I don't think there's much else that I want to say right now. Good seeing all of you again. Thank you, Mr. Ogden. R. Robinson, followed by Bill Elliott. <coughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, Homeland Security Secretary Becerra admitted this week, uh, he said, we know the vax is killing people of color, blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans at twice the rate of whites. Uh, the medical freedom movement is steadily growing. Witness the Defeat the Mandate rally downtown L.A. nine days ago, hosted by uh, Del Bigtree. Uh, the need for a constitutional amendment so medical uh, tyranny, martial law, uh, doesn't r repeat itself again or become a permanent fact of life in the future is obvious. The need to avoid medical tyranny is obvious. Uh, these, these, these two books prove that the COVID is a bioweapon and uh, the government media narrative is a pack of lies. Every gene therapy vaccine is a synthetic virus and or a cytotoxin venom delivery system. The engineered bioweapon delivery system is a syringe and a lipid nanoparticle envelope contained in the jab. Uh, GMO lab engineered genetic, genetically modified uh, cytotoxins are... Uh, EUA authorized uh, gene therapy, uh, experimental gene therapy, not a, not a virus or an organism. Propaganda driven fear mongering uh, is a globalist uh, scam. Uh, we've seen uh, a eugenics operation or genocide. Uh, this has been recently proven by two experienced researchers. Uh, Dr. Brian Artis and uh, Karen Kingston of uh, La Jolla, California. Their discoveries put them on the front line as candidates for the Nobel Peace or Nobel Prize in Medicine for 2022. The details of how and why uh, we've been tricked and we've been uh, through so much for two years has, has recently been explained by these two people. Uh, it's a globalist cabal. Uh, it's a vaccine cult. Uh, we need to stop drinking the Kool-Aid uh, provide, pro provided and produced by the World Economic Forum. This experimental gene therapy fiasco must end. People are coming into hospitals with elevated D-dimers, pneumonia, heart, heart, uh, heart problems, strokes, uh, and a multiplicity of other symptoms. The medical care they are receiving is inadequate, especially if they happen to be unjabbed. Because the standard treatment protocol that has been dictated these past two years is deadly. Uh, CDC shouldn't be practicing medicine or imposing themselves into the private doctor-patient relationship. <clears throat> Remdesivir, uh, part of the D.C. dictated standard COVID treatment protocol, is a deadly toxin. Medical uh, payment incentives under the CARES Act must end. Financial incentives for COVID deaths in a hospital setting must end. Financial incentives uh, uh, artificially raise the pandemic death toll. Uh, these are illegal practices and panics people. It also violates the Nuremberg Code on, the, on medical experimentation because of the lack of pre-jab informed consent. Section 
3024 of the CARES Act, signed into law by Obama on December 13th, 2016, as H.R. 34, mandates that informed consent can be waived in an emergency. The COVID emergency use authorization, the experimental jab the uh, government considers an emergency, but it's actually fraud and stupid incompetency. Additionally, medical fear-mongering uh, has killed millions and, and millions have died unnecessarily. You know, forget about the mosquitoes. December 3024, uh, 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 the Section 3024 that I'm talking about uh, are fee uh, makes feasible waivers granted or alterations for clinical investigations are contrary to the benefit of humans. If artists in Kingston, uh, let me finish the sentence. Okay. If artists in Kingston are correct, people could not take the should not take the jab. They have fully explained what we've been experiencing in the past two years: a federal government Medicare incentivized Jonestown massacre. That's a long. Everything sentence. everything I just said should be submitted to the state attorney general's office Thank you, Mr. and Robinson. tested in a federal courtroom. Our next speaker is Bill Robinson. That's me. Um, excuse me, Bill Elliott. <laughs> another five minutes. I got, a, I got another five minutes. Next time, next time. <laughs> everything, to be continued. Everything I said, That's if it gets continue. into a court uh, courtroom, there's nothing false. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Good evening, the city council. My name is Bill Robinson. Bill Elliott. <laughs> uh, I'm an organ donor. I encourage everyone in the sound of my voice to become an organ donor. It's a great program. You don't need it after you're dead anyway. Uh, I had the privilege of accompanying the mayor pro tem to the Ochoa home this last week. And uh, what a nice family. And their neighbors spontaneously all showed up. We had about 10 people there, including us. And you know, my overwhelming feeling was how much these people love West Covina. They really love the city, and it's really evident. And it's such a breath of fresh air, you know, if you want to torture yourself and get on West Covina social media. You know, some of the people in this very room trash the city at every turn. We all know their names. All they do is gripe and complain and bellyache and a few other words. But it was really nice meeting the Ochoas and... Uh, it was funny, we asked them, well, how did those other signs get here, That the existing ones? Because there's a couple, there's a light, and there's a, some arrows. And she said, oh, that's me. I did that. He says, hey, like 15 years ago, I came to the city and got that done. And it's not enough. So I hope you guys can really help the Ochoas uh, and their neighbors solve the problem. Uh, my wife and I went to Texas, and we were you know, she was absent last meeting, and... Uh, uh, we had a great 10-day trip, and it was uh, its kind of a special kind of hell to stay in 10 hotel rooms in 10 nights. Uh, I don't wish that on anybody, and we would do that trip different if we could do it over. Next time we will. And uh, so we got back home, and, uh, you know, I just want to tell you a short story. My dad, uh, when I was a kid, I had a neighbor had a German Shepherd, and I asked him, Dad, can we get a German Shepherd? And he goes, no. I go, but Dad, I really want a German Shepherd. My friend has one. It's a really cool dog. You really want a German Shepherd? He said, no. I said, why not? He says, uh, the gate, the fence, the food, the vet, the liability. We're not getting a German Shepherd. Start out. Stop asking me. So uh, I realized, well, actually, he told me, I have some good news for you. When you grow up, you get to have a German Shepherd. So uh, four and a half years ago, we got a German Shepherd from the Baldwin Park Animal Shelter. And uh, we saved him. He was, German Shepherds don't last very long on a kill shelter line. Uh, so we adopted him, and we had a few issues with him at the beginning. He had some separation anxiety from his old family. And uh, he was a great dog, though. We had a little bit of undoing to do, but he was really a loving, loving dog, very loving dog. Well, we got home, and he spent 11 nights in Heavenly Pet Resort here in north of the city. And... Uh, I picked him up, and he was so happy to see me, and I took him home. He recognized the house. He was kind of going a little bit crazy. I think he thought we gave him away. 
And uh, less than 24 hours, he was dead. He died of bloat. And I never even heard of it. I was a German Shepherd owner, never heard of bloat. But it kills large breed dogs like standard poodles and German Shepherd are number one and two on the list. So I didn't know what happened to him. My wife said, you know, the dog's crying in the backyard. And I went in the backyard to see him, and he was in distress, and I could tell he was afraid. And I loaded him up in the car, and I'm trying to follow navigation. My wife's on the phone. She were trying to get to a pet hospital. Every veterinarian in West Covina that we called, every single one refused to take him. That was heartbreaking because he could have been saved if the proper procedure had been implemented. Uh, I ended up taking him all the way to Glendora to an animal hospital that was closed, which was just devastating. He was flailing around in my car. He was dying. And I know there's a lot of pet lovers in West Covina, and we need a pet hospital, an emergency pet hospital, at least in the area. People have told me about one in Diamond Bar and one in Upland. You know, I, I went all the way to Grove Avenue in, in Ontario, Rancho Cucamonga, and he died in my arms in the parking lot. And we really need an emergency pet hospital in the area. We have everything else. And I don't know what the city council can do in that regard. I, I don't want to say I lost respect for the veterinary trade, but I was really angry with them that day. Nobody would see my dog. And if you have a large breed dog, educate yourself about bloat because from first symptom to death, it was two hours. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speaker cards, Mayor. And um, City Manager, is there anything to respond to from public comment? Um, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council, members of the public. I'll try and briefly respond to some of the comments and suggestions made. Um, the Ochoa family um, has made quite clear the requests and the needs of that neighborhood. Our um, traffic engineer has um, begun to evaluate some of these additional requests. Many of the ones that were made have already been in the works. And in fact, will, that contract will be implemented. They've been issued a notice to proceed starting next Monday. So a number of things are happening there. Um, but not everything that's been suggested just recently. There will be some flashing stop signs at um, Garvey Avenue South and Cherrywood. There will be additional um, signage removed and replaced. There will be some chevrons installed. I just want to assure the council and, and the Ochoas that the traffic engineer is evaluating every single one of these additional requests, things for like the speed humps, um, ways to reduce the speed on Garvey, um, and, and her process is to do a scientific evaluation based on traffic engineering principles and then to make her professional recommendations to the traffic committee. In, in my mind, it's analogous to um, in the old days when you got a home loan, you had to go in front of the loan committee. The loan committee wanted to say yes, but you had to meet the criteria. The criteria in place are her professional judgment and the California Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So we'll see some immediate things happen out there right away, um, starting as soon as next week that contract is in the field and in the ground, and a lot of people will be happy about that. But the additional things are going to work their way through, through the system to the traffic committee and then back to council. But we'll, we'll stay on top of these things. We're taking it quite seriously on the staff side. Um, Mr. Ogden talked about the flag. We were happy to help. Um, there's an item on your consent calendar tonight pertaining to military equipment. It sounds a little official, a little ominous. This is a policy enacted by state law AB 481 that requires the city to publicly um, enunciate, publicly announce what equipment we have in use. This doesn't add any additional equipment or take away any equipment, but it's a, a way to memorialize on your agenda so that the public can see what equipment we have and what equipment we're using, and that puts us in compliance with state law. We think that equipment is justified and necessary, and we don't plan to change that. Assuming you approve the policy tonight, that'll, that'll be the case going forward. Um, Mr. Robinson talked about uh, COVID vaccines again. I continue to encourage everybody to seek their own personal medical advice in this area. It's a lot of information out there, but I 
would recommend that people talk to their their doctor and get get medical advice from someone who who has a, de- a degree in medicine. Um, and I just like to finish by offering my condolences to Mr. Elliot. I know what it means to lose a pet. I've been to that emergency pet hospital in Diamond Bar. They're quite good. But maybe as a city, we can reach out to some of these um, emergency hospitals and just solicit them and see if they would be interested in a West Covina address, because I know there's a need. I've been through that struggle as well. And again, I'm very sorry for your loss, sir. That's all I've got. I have a question from Councilman Wu. Uh, and I'm, my understanding that on the Citrus McIntyre Square, they have an animal hospital, right? Have you tried that one? Okay, that one. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I know on the McIntyre Square they have a so-called uh, animal hospital. Okay, I don't. I don't know. That is, they will take care of the the dog. Okay, and that's the first thing. And the second thing I want to add on the Mr. Ochoa. Okay, regarding again, I I, I live on this street for fourteen years or this neighborhood for fourteen years, and I we still driving. Okay, to. Okay, if we go to Glendora Avenue, we will drive on the Garvey, get into the gas station, and go into the back. And so, is it, it the street from uh, Lock Allen okay, into the East Garvey South and go to the okay Cherrywood? It basically has no stop sign and is in the back of uh, people's property and uh, on the freeway petition. So, uh, I think a lot of people speeding right there when they get into the Okay, and uh, okay, uh, Lock Allen, okay, so from that street. Again, okay, my kid grew up on the top day school, if you guys still remember, now it's all the condo. Okay, so, so from there, so maybe we can have uh, our, okay, traffic engineer to see, can we, in the middle of the street, we can suggest to put a bump, and then when people make a right turn, we say, bump ahead. So in that way, maybe you can stop people so they don't speed going to end of your home. Your home has been hit many times. I, I know it when I was living over there. So maybe this is something, the way we can solve this once for all. And that from gas station gain to the cherry wood, their home has been hit many times too. And that's why they put the, the blocker. So hopefully we can do the similar thing to keep that corner, okay, safe, because they have that children riding the bike and the play in the front yard. So hopefully we can protect okay the resident to have their family in front of their front yard or something. So so this is my suggestion possible we can okay do that for our traffic engineer to look into it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Wu. We also have comments from our Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Tas Castellanos. Um yes, when I met with the Ochoas, um it was very uh it really concerned me that this last accident that they had was like at six o'clock in the afternoon. And that's when people are walking around. And, and I, it was just the video that he sent me, um, was so, and it impacted me a lot, you know, and I just hope that we can really make that effort to make those mediums that are just south of Cherrywood that really do work. I mean, they really slow people down. And so if we can just put them right where they're located on the north side of Cherrywood, I think that would make a major difference. And I just hope that the traffic committee and our traffic person can help out in doing this. I'm still thinking, besides to put a blocker in that corner, because when they hit the bucket, already too late. But I think in the, when, okay, okay, from the lock island, you're coming in, make a right turn and people speeding, Okay, they're like crazy. So maybe in the middle of the, the street, we need to put a okay, a um, bump, okay, um, bumper, okay. So bump, okay, so people can just speed in, like because again, this you can see there's a people's backyard with their fence, okay, a block wall, and another side is the freeway. So you can see, and the, okay, you can see some graffiti. Sometimes people are tagging over there. So because it's like seclusive area. So if we can. In the middle, okay, put a road bump, okay, so we can kind of slow down people and we want them, okay, road bump is in the middle, then you will slow down the traffic, go into the end, then you won't hit the left and right. So uh, this is my suggestion possible, but I don't know how feasible for our traffic engineer because the sign, I've been, again, I've living over there 14 years, they sign over there for a long time. They have an orange sign, they have all this yellow to warn people, but people still, hit into uh, those home, okay, over there. So this is my suggestion, possible slow down. I think the street, street humps would be helpful. 
I think it would be a rude awakening when a speeder that's drunk would probably wake up if he ran into these speed humps. Not a speed bump, but a, ste a speed hump, which I think, would, I think it would help out. So. Thank you. Thank you both. Any further comments? No? City Manager, do you have a report? Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I do have a brief um, City Manager's report this evening. On your agenda tonight is a Council of Public's first look at the city's annual budget. I wanted to keep context in terms of where we are in this process. In March, we commissioned a budget survey. We've gotten some response to that. Um, on April 5th, the Council um, received and filed the long-range financial forecast so we could look out for five years. Um, tonight, you're going to get a presentation, um, a PowerPoint presentation about it. We're going to have a series of community workshops. I say series, we're going to have two. We're going to have one in this chamber tomorrow night, and then we're going to have a second one at the Senior Center um, on May the 4th. It'll be the same presentation at both. The public's welcome to come to both. The one that's here will be broadcast. We don't have the capacity to do that easily at the Senior Center, but I would encourage people to come and, and hear about the budget to express their, their interests and their concerns. We'll have a um, budget status update again in front of Council on May the 17th, and then it'll return on June the 7th for consideration of adoption. The fiscal year begins on um, July the 1st. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, I'd just like to take a moment to publicly thank our finance director, Stephanie Sikama. She's Her team have done a really good job, and the budget has a new look to it. I think you'll like it, but we'll get to that later this evening. Um, I wanted to mention the paper shredding event the city had last Saturday was uh, regarded to be a pretty good success. They recycled um, three tons of paper. We'll um, keep that on the agenda for, for future events. We got some good turnout. Wanted to um, ask the public, invite the public to save the date for a 4th of July Heroes Parade and Independence Day Street Fair. The event will be held on Monday, July the 4th. We're gonna get the word out via social media and that push will begin tomorrow. Wanted to highlight some maintenance work that you've been seeing around town. This one is um, a new sidewalk poured, poured today in front of the Senior Center. The council had commissioned a um, assessment of the sidewalks. We're doing that by quadrant of the city. I spoke today to our contractor who is doing that work. He'll have that evaluation report um, completed by the end of next week and then we'll know definitively by area of the city, um, an area at a time, which sidewalks are easily solved with grinding and which ones are gonna need this type of permanent replacement. But we know we've got a lot of needs in this area and um, it's heartening to me to see our own crews out doing it. They really like this kind of work and they're, they're good at it. I like the quality of it. This is uh, another example of some sidewalk repair work happening um, on Glendora Avenue. Wanted to mention that our annual street rehabilitation project will um, commence next Monday. Um, all of the streets on this map highlighted in blue will be uh, cold plain down two inches and they'll get an existing or an, an asphalt cap overlay. The, the other streets, the ones that are in green, will get a type two slurry. Slurry is the emulsion that goes over streets that helps us get um, additional life out of the asphalt that corrects the raveling and the weathering and prevents the surface water from getting in. Um, this work will take approximately uh, two months to complete, so we're expecting to be wrapped up by June of this year. Notices to the homeowners were distributed this morning. City managers, what area is this? Is behind the mall or something? Well, there, the, some of the streets within that area, I, I can't name them all because there's about 100 of them, but California, Broadmoor, Shady Dale, this entire neighborhood. I can get you a street list if you're interested. I'll make sure I get it for you. So basically, it's a, a west of the the mall area. So basically, uh, south, south, south in the western part southwest. of the city. Yes, got it. So it's in this neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned to the Achoas, our citywide uh, vehicle and traffic safety improvement program is also going to commence on Monday, April 25th. The council awarded this bid at the January 18th meeting. They posted their insurance. We issued a notice to proceed. We've had a pre-construction meeting. Um, there are 30 different intersections um, that are being treated with new signage, new striping, new pavement markers. 
new uh, solar LED flashing stop signs and, and other improvements. You know, this has been of um, high level of concern by one of my council members. I love that smile. And um, Monday is our start date. I just wanted to take a moment and talk about some different things that are happening in the area of intergovernmental relations. It seems like this is a pretty busy season. And I'll go quickly so you can get to your agenda. Um, just FYI, there has been some interest expressed in naming the West Covina Post Office in honor of Congressman Esteban Torres. That would require federal legislation, so that's going to be in the hands of the Congresswoman Napolitano. Um, the, the meetings with the state California Department of Health are continuing. The next one is scheduled for April 27th. We're continuing to expect that they'll promulgate regulations and, and the process by which municipalities or new counties would want to stand up a health department would follow. But until they do, we're just continuing to, to wait for that moment. Work is continuing on the SB 1383 compliance. Um, we have sought the mayor sent letters to various different elected officials. The response has been um, crickets. And I don't think that legislative relief is very likely. They have a process of herding the cities into compliance with notices of violation. We are not on the problem child list, not yet, and I plan to stay off of it. I think we'll get into compliance. But um, they're hoping to avoid issuing um, notices of violation, which would be a 90-day notice, and then the second notice would be another 90, so you can buy six months being out of compliance. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be in that status. We're trying to stay ahead of that curve. But the city's going to have to make some choices. Um, I think it's going to come down to a council choice between whether we have a one-time residential rate hike of, you know, 19 or 20 percent, or whether we are able to transition those costs over time, either by doing um, the services in-house or using the hauler to do them. We've issued an RFP to seek some professional assistance. There are, are a number of firms that specialize in this area, and we're about to find out whether there's a firm that's interested in assisting with implementation. And I'll continue to report back once we get that into focus a bit more. And finally, I just wanted to mention that there's a lot of federal money available right now. We've submitted a $7 million grant to upgrade Azusa Avenue, including uh, ADA compliance. They needed some more information from us today. They want it by close of business tomorrow. This is always how that works. But we're going to try and, and get that in by their deadline. And the mayor wrote a, a nice letter of support for that one as well. That's all I've got this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. That moves us to our consent calendar. Uh, Council, is there anything you'd like to pull from consent? S Mr. City Manager. Excuse me, Mayor. Thank you. I'd like to change my recommendation for consent calendar item number three, which is consideration of award of bid for the Waldemarado Park restroom due to a technical issue that came up during the bid. I'm changing my recommendation this evening that you uh, reject all bids, and I'll put it back out to bid and return that item to you. Understood. So for number three, recommendation is to reject all bids and put it back out to bid. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Uh, aside from that recommendation, would the council wish to pull anything? Seeing none, uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve all except three with the uh, city manager's recommendation? I'll make a motion to move. Second. We've got a first and a second. Could we have roll call, please? I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Diaz, a second by Council Member Tabatabai to approve consent items one through six, changing the recommendation on item number three to reject all bids and rebid. I also, I also have an ordinance title I need to read. Ordinance number 2497, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of West Covina, California, adopting a military equipment policy governing the use of military equipment pursuant to Assembly Bill 481. Council Member Tabatabai. Aye. Councilman Wu? Aye. Councilwoman Lopez Viado? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Diaz? Aye. Mayor Castellanos? Aye. Items pass 5 0. Thank you. Moving on from the consent calendar, we go to departmental regular matters. Item number seven is proposed fiscal year 2022 to 23 budget. Mr. City Manager, who, will it be? Our finance director, Stephanie, who will present? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> OK, 
Good evening. Good evening. So to start, citywide, um, the city has over $126 million in revenue next fiscal year, and expenditures are expected to be over $128 million. The majority of our revenue comes from property tax, followed by sales tax. Uh, on an expenditure side, the majority of our expenditures goes towards salaries and benefits. Looking specifically at the general fund, which is the city's major operating fund, the proposed general fund budget has been structurally balanced with a net change in fund balance estimated to be over 500,000. Um, the ending fund balance is expected to be a little over 24.6 million, which is way over the 17% reserve requirement. In looking at fund balance, the chart, the chart in front of you is from the last seven years, and you can see that our fund balance has increased up to about 25 million last fiscal year, and we're at, uh, expected to dip a little bit, but then level out again this fiscal year. So this budget has been conservatively, conservatively designed to continue to adequately maintain the city's reserves. Looking at general fund revenue, revenue is estimated to be 79.7 .7 million, this is an increase of 12 million or 17.8% from the original fiscal year 21-22 budget because we are seeing a comeback from the pandemic. But this is only a 2.6% change from the current year estimate. As you can see in the chart, the top line is the proposed budget for revenue for fiscal year 22-23, and the one below that is the estimate. So you can see that we're not increasing that much over the estimate, however, our original budget had assumed that the pandemic would still be ongoing and that we would be struggling from recovery. Um, so that is the difference between the two. Sales tax is up almost 2.4 million from fiscal year 21-22 and is projected to be conservative, conservatively increased by 1.5% in the next fiscal year. And that's the big jump that you see in between the original budget and the estimate, which goes up significantly. And then this year it levels out in the next fiscal year. General fund expenditures are expected to be, are proposed to be about 63.9 million, so almost for 64 million. This is up 9.8 million or 18.3% from the original budget, but it's up only up 5.9% again from the current year estimate. Um, most of the general fund expenditures go towards salaries and benefits with over 79%. And over the past years, the city ex the past year, the city executed memorandum, memorandums of understanding with eight of the nine of its bargaining units whose obligations have been incorporated into this budget as well. Additionally, expenditures overall were analyzed and projected to reflect the actual expenses incurred based on the current year estimate in prior years. Um, one of the major expenditures in salary and benefits is the city's overtime. Uh, over time, it continues to be an increasing burden on the city. However, it, the proposed budget is um, proposed to actually include what is realistic. And based on prior year actuals, um, we're looking a little over $6.2 million for this year. And based on current year projections and the increase in all of our salaries, we are proposing $6.4 million to bring it to a realistic level. The majority of overtime is from both fire and police. Some changes to this budget. Um, the budget includes funding to bring recreation and community service programs back to pre-pandemic levels. This includes special events such as Spring Festival, Fourth of July, Egg Hunt, um, and Halloween. We also are proposing to bring back the quarterly newsletter to inform and engage residents. We have also included in the budget uh, increase in maintenance operations and so specifically to increase the tree trim cycle from seven to five years. In addition, the capital improvement plan or budget totals over 17 million for the next fiscal year. We have also included a health department budget, um, which is proposed to be self-sustaining and an enterprise fund. We do have some proposed changes to staffing. 
But overall, the net change in staffing is 14 new positions proposed. 12 of those are maintenance positions that would be fully funded by special revenue funds, so no general fund spending. Um, we are also proposing to add one full-time non-sworn public safety position, and then two part-time um, positions in HR and planning. We have proposed to remove one position in finance and upgrade one part-time position in IT to full-time. Um, the long-range financial forecast that was on the previous agenda projected deficits for each year in the, fiscal, in the forecast. The general fund rev reserves were anticipated to be depleted to 10% or $8 million by fiscal year 2027. That forecast recommended structural changes to increase revenues and or expenditures or decrease expenditures in future years. So as a result, this budget that you see before you took several things into account in order to get it to a different level this fiscal year. First off, we removed frozen non-sworn personnel and police. There were eight positions total that were on the books but were considered frozen. The financial forecast had assumed those positions would be budgeted, so we removed those. Um, we assumed that we would be reinstating the false alarm program and associated revenue. We also adjusted to prior year actuals across the board. Prior budgets had always been looking back at budgeted amounts instead of actuals. This year, we scrubbed everything and went down to actual trends with estimated increases based on um, the multi-year financial forecast uh, assumptions. Revenue bases were also raised and are projected to increase conservatively in the next fiscal year, but those bases were raised based on current year estimates. As we've seen a jump in sales tax, we don't expect that to go down, but we don't expect it to also increase at the rate at which it did the last uh, fiscal year. However, because we know that sales tax can swing one way or another, it is not recommended to commit this revenue to reoccurring obligations. So we did not include a lot of reoccurring obligations in the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget in consideration of that. Moving on to the capital improvement program, there is over 94.6 million proposed in projects over the course of the five years. Um, 46 million is currently in projects underway or from prior years that we're currently working on um, with a total of 65 projects that are be currently being worked on, um, whether they were initiated in the prior years or in the current year, we currently have that many in progress. Um, for next fiscal year, we're proposing 17.7 .7 million um, across 38 projects total. And this is just a chart that shows where that CIP money comes from. The majority of it comes from grants. Um, the city received over 19 million from the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA. And so that is where you see the big jump in our capital improvement funding. The second biggest funding source would be our general fund. Um, next is just to go over the schedule that the city manager had recently done. Tomorrow night we have a community workshop and then May 4th and we plan to bring back the uh, feedback we get from those workshops along with the budget survey at the May 17th budget status meet update and then um, receive any feedback from council so that we can make any changes before hopefully coming before you for adoption on June 7th. And then lastly, I do want to add that at the entrance and for you, we've added a budget brief that will be on the website too that we have available for everybody. That's just a one page flyer of what the budget includes. And with that, I will take any questions. Councilman Wu. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, okay uh, the budget basically just like my understanding, just like typical household, you run your home, you have expenditure and you have income. Okay, and if you okay spend the money less than okay, and uh, what uh, you come in, then you have a deficit. But in the, in the opposite, then you got saving in the bank as a, a reserve. Okay, and then and the, so a couple of things. Okay, on the expenditures. Okay, my okay request is how we control okay the overtime. Okay, and uh, how we deal with that and how we reduce the lawsuit, okay, because that will be all surprised how much you're going to pay for and, and that will be potentially into, okay, our budget. So that is what I sit over here being always surprised that we have to pay additional uh, lawsuit by some issue. So just these two things, overtime and lawsuit, I think this is what, okay, the expenditure that we can, how can we control. But on the income, okay, I, I know you based on, Okay, and the 
previous years, but I based on the projection. So I, I know you maybe didn't calculate. Okay, the some of the projection have you add into the Plaza West Covina? I think we done with our redevelop agency by September. It pay off, and we should have additional sales tax. Dave, would you mind? I can so I can see. Yeah, <laughs> no, I was. Yes, this did so, take so in. That will maybe give us almost $2 million additional income that we've been waiting for a long, long time. In September, I think Plaza West Covina that is a sales tech genera generator for us. And uh, we'll let into our future budget with this income. Because, okay, rather than, okay, try to, okay, and based on, okay, we, what we have, can we create, okay, more development, more of this to create sell more cars that can help the dealer so we can accumulate more income. So this is the first thing, plus West Covina, okay, with that September, my understanding, we should start in receiving finally, okay, the sales tax, roughly close to the $2 million. Second thing, internet sales. Okay, my understanding, internet sales is a big one right now due to a lot of people okay, like to order online. I know they're based on the population. And we calculate this income, okay, that comes to the city. Let, let me think, okay, you can answer. Okay, number three, development. Okay, we have a development, for example, okay, and the, uh, the, the, the green lot on the Faith Church. Right now, that, that they sold for $54 million. We should have a 14% of property tax, and that will become to us. So have we calculate that income for the future's sake? And the, all the development with, uh, okay, uh, Vincent Home, okay, Pioneer Home, Okay, Cameron 84, okay, and some other development, have we calculated some of the, this already making, so we should have some sales tax, that we should have a 14% of income. So, and the, and the fee we charge with those development, so we should have some income. So that's what I'm saying is, okay, I, I based on the projection that income popular, maybe not on your book yet. Okay, so I want to ask, is this the future income? You're not going to put in the book, or this is something you already calculate? Thank you. Yes, so a lot of those things we're taking to in consideration. I'll start with sales tax, for example. The city already receives a significant portion of the CFD sales tax as it comes back to us, um, but we did look at that and examine it. The sales tax was also um, brought to levels which were recommended by HDL, and we were consistent with that, if not just slightly more conservative than them. But for the most part, we definitely saw a huge increase there. In terms of... a uh, property taxes. We don't have the valuations exactly on our books. We were only able to increase based on what we've uh, seen from the county and estimated up on that. Um, but then in terms of the building and development, sorry, we did increase those yeah. as well or assume that they would be and as high. Regarding this, okay, property tax, I'm sorry to interrupt you. The property tax, for example, on, on the face church, that's a non-profit, so we never get a dime mm -hmm. of a property tax. Now they sold for $54 million dollars and uh, we should receive a 14% of the property tax. So that is the potential income will come to us. It's, it's absolutely will come to us because they already sold and they, they already have to pay the property tax and we should have a 14%. That should be our income. So 14% of $54 million of property tax, I think that's quite a lot of money will come to the city, possible million will come to the city. It's additional income. I, I'm not going to paint roses. I just want to know how much income we will come and let it, sh it should come to a city. Thank you. Yes. So overall, just to state, we did increase revenue significantly um, to bring the city to uh, to get us structurally balanced. And those numbers um, weren't, we're looking back, but also looking at what we're seeing today and looking at all the different development we're seeing today, and then we're also anticipating all of our recreation programs, for example, coming back to pre-pandemic levels. So revenues overall were increased um, to those pre-pandemic levels, and then also surpassed that in terms of sales tax. So Stephanie, so what I just mentioned, all this income not on your book yet. So this basically no. will be the future book. No, Well, there it is in the proposed budget already because I we basically took the proposed budget to almost 80 million in revenue, whereas the last year's original budget was about, if I'm just looking at this, in between 67 million. 
So how much increase we have based on what this, okay, uh, much more solid income that we will receive. So we will know this money will come to us. So this is not a, okay, something we're looking forward, but this will come to us due to property tax, they have to pay. Sales tax fee is always sold. They have to pay the basically just the property tax, 14% to the city. We should have a guaranteed income come to us. Because before there's a school property, I don't think we receive any, okay, income at all. But now it's a development. And just with all those development property taxes, 14%, that is going to increase so much for our future budget. Yes. So the just speaking from numbers, so um, the proposed budget for next year has increased revenues of twelve over twelve million from last year's original budget. So we have taken into account a lot of the growth that we're seeing into that. I, I think it's a very good twelve million dollar, but hopefully you can get more. <laughs> well, we always want news. more, but <laughs> good job, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Wu. Um, any more questions of staff? No. And Stephanie, is there anything else you'd like to add? Nope, just community workshops and the flyer. Uh, no, we. Well, according to this, we do have to make a motion, or do or do we just receive a file? We do make a motion. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve staff recommendation? I'll so move. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. A tie for first. <laughs> <laughs> we got a uh, motion by Councilwoman Letty Lopez Viado. And I'll second it. There we go. And a second by Mayor Pro Tem Diaz. Yeah, I, kick out. Yeah, I, out. I have a motion by Councilwoman Lopez Viado, a second by Mayor Pro Tem Diaz. Councilmember Tabatabai. Aye. Councilman Wu. Aye. Councilwoman Lopez Viado. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Diaz. Aye. Mayor Castellanos. Aye. The recommendation passes 5 0. And it takes us to the end of our agenda. Do I have any council member reports, requests, or comments? Mayor Pro Tem Diaz. I have Mother May I. All right. Okay. So I understand that right now we have, I guess, temporary um, facilities for outside dining in the Glendora area. And I understand that... Um, that it may be ending by the end of the year, possibly. So what I was wondering, if we can have the staff, well, I want the staff, <laughs> to look into uh, maybe, ex not extending, but maybe having like standards in place so that we can make this maybe more permanent um, outside dining for some of these facilities. So I, I want to work on that area and... Um, so uh, I'm thinking that maybe the restaurant owners would be happy to extend that and make it and have some standards so that we can continue with the outside dining. Thank you for that. Councilman Wu. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is a good idea. I will support your mother may I. I think with the city, uh, due to if with this virus kind of subside currently, okay, and uh, I know other city already request uh, a lot of restaurants to remove they are temporarily 10. So, and, uh, and I think in Glendora, my understanding last time we went to the lunch with a uh, bounce street and they say they Friday night, they pack. So, so how can we help this area? And they're willing to make it nicer. So uh, maybe city, like you say, right? You want to look into how the city can find a uh, ordinance to help them maybe year by year, not just give them permanent, right. but year by year to see how can they beautify the neighborhood, have people willing to, okay, eat outside, but at the same time, we'll create more, okay, patron, okay, and uh, help the restaurant have more business. Right. And, uh, and to make the street nicer. Mm -hmm. and maybe we'll look into how we put light, right. the, the, the light on the tree, uh, well, to make right. it so enticing? Currently, currently what I've done is I've, um, I went ahead and I reviewed the street lights and the sidewalk lights and I provided some lights that need to be replaced that are not lit now. So that's hopefully we can get that in the works. And so it could be more lit up there. Um, and there's other areas that need to be worked on. So we want to revitalize that area and we want more people to come in and, and uh, enjoy the restaurants there and the outside dining in the summertime as well. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea. But at the same time, we, we need to kind of differentiate, okay, two 
two area. One is that is a city owned land. We can try to do the thing. Another one is private owned land, like a shopping mall. Okay, a lot of shopping square, they already have somebody outside. And how we help them with the landlord to find a way to, okay, a little bit long term, but they can build it five watts in just 10. Okay, look temporarily, hopefully we can, okay, okay, with the city looking to the oldness, see how we can help our restaurant and look into the private area and the Gondora is public area like city owned land to help look into the coordinates. And I'm not I'm not saying just limited to Glendora because I know there's other restaurants, but you know, so all restaurants that have that in place now, you know, if we can extend it or, or have some standards put in place for all our restaurants in the area. So thank you for that. Sounds like a good recommendation. Um any anything else? Any other reports, comments? I had a comment. Okay. Um, thank you for the Easter event. I know we attended um, Cortez first and then Del Norte next, but um, I know that this is the first time they actually opened up another egg hunt for the special needs children, which you know I missed um, at Cortez because I was at Del Norte. But that was uh, catering to those that are in need and you know those that have um, issues with being around so many people or disabilities or anything like that. So that was nice to see. A lot of cities don't have that. So it was nice to see that West Covina did that and catered to um, another population that was able to enjoy the event. So thank you for putting out this great, fabulous event for the egg hunt. And it was a lot of children, a lot of people, and they greatly appreciate it. They had fun and hope everybody else had a wonderful Easter weekend. But thank you. I know I promised Steph I don't talk too much, but I cannot help it. <laughs> okay, and, and uh, just follow up about, okay, uh, the uh, councilwoman, uh, we got an egg hunt. And uh, uh, again, again, I've been done, had done this for six years, moving to seven years. Okay, and uh, beside the pandemic, two years that off, I never see so many children. I never see so many crowd at Cortez Park. I've I, I done 2016, 17, 18, 19, but this is a huge crowd. Okay, huge. Okay, and uh, I I want to thank the staff. Okay, and uh, the resident coming out big time. Okay, to enjoy the outdoor. Okay, and the staff to put all the egg hunt into different area, and including the special need children. And uh, again, I want to thank staff. Okay, to do such a wonderful job, and it's so considerate. Okay, and uh, and I think I only see this. Okay, happy, smiling children, and this is what we're here for, and to help our community and to help our children to have a much better, with this pandemic, I think a lot of them very depressed, but with this, I will want to bring the normalcy back to our city. But, yeah, what pandemic? Thank you so much, staff. Thank you. Councilman Tabatabai. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I just want to uh, piggyback on uh, what was said, staff and Kiwanis uh, did a wonderful job and, uh, you know, thank you to Councilwoman uh, Lopez Viado uh, for mentioning how inclusive the events were. Uh, and, you know, I just want to highlight, you know, Friendship Park is going to be a completely inclusive uh, play area. And we're working on getting some some more inclusive play areas at our other parks. And I think that's something uh, you mentioned the Azusa project that we're putting in a grant for, right? Trying to make those sidewalks ADA accessible uh, and just really uh, acknowledging, right, that uh, we want to be able to make sure every resident uh, can enjoy the city. So I think the city's on the right path. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. No other questions or comments. All right, that concludes our meeting. We are adjourned. Are you?